Just like language, traditions and art evolve and change, and you're making masks differently than your ancestors did. Most certainly am. Uh, my ancestors, uh, <sighs> we were nomadic people, so things like this were too heavy. They would have laughed probably, they would have loved it, but they probably used it for firewood because <laughs> uh, they were nomadic and everything was a functional art. And that's what I'm trying to bring to the world. And that's why I do this type of mask really quick, is this type of thing, is because this brings a lot of uh, notoriety. People love it. They want to know where I come from. So I tell them where I come from, and then I'm as good and we'll stick away. And that my people, yes, they have done this, but in the past, uh, it would have been done uh, uh, for more ceremonial purposes. They would have been smaller and worn. About, about the size of a human face? Right, exactly. And worn. And worn. And they would have done that. Those are the stories. But they wouldn't have done anything to hang up in their, in their, in their wigwams or anything like that. They like said it would have been too big. But why I do this is because it brings me attention. The attention I want to bring is that we have some of the best artists in the world here on the East Coast Canada, Canada and Wabanaki uh, territory. And, uh, and that's what I want to bring is because, like I said, we are nomadic people. So our art had to be functional art. And a lot of art in the world is not functional and people are not used to functional art, that it can be beautiful and functional. So what I'm telling people is, yes, these are beautiful, but my people originally, like I said, they would have been smaller. But my people would have been doing the canoes the baskets, uh, the paddles, the snowshoes, the things that were saving their lives. But what was the purpose of a mask that you could wear? What was the function? Ceremonial purposes, uh, my elders have told me. So it would, it would have been shaman type things. It would have been ceremonies that they would have been used at. Because there are, there are old masks that have been found and charred a few that have been found. Donald has actually shown me a few. So yes, and he's the one that really I talk to a lot. I go to for a lot of my information in the past and to this day. But yes, he's the one that said that we definitely use them in our ceremonies. And, and yet so few survive. Yes. They either rotted away. Right. If they were buried, they would have remained for a long, long time, or they were burned, perhaps. Uh, exactly. A combination of a ceremony. It, that's the thing I'm so proud of our, uh, my uh, community and my people as well. Everything goes back to the earth. Everything. It goes back there. It doesn't matter, like you said, if it was buried. That's something different, too. Uh, my people, everything went with them. These days, you pass it on to your kids and your grandkids and stuff like that, but it was different back then. So not much has survived. Uh, I have actually some stone tools in here, if you want to take this up another notch. I have some stone tools in there that are upwards of five to 7,000 years old. I actually have uh, gouge in there that I could bring mine out and you can put them side by side and the only difference is one's made out of stone, one's made out of metal and the 7,000 years in between use. What, what caused you to want to make them bigger? Um, in the art world, uh, I, I want to bring notoriety, I want to bring attention to my people. And this day and age, size matters. So, and it also, as you see in these pieces, when people see them, they realize that they take me hundreds of hours. Uh, I spent a hundred hours on these alone, just in sanding, because I want to show uh, the art that comes from my culture. My, they're very proud. Everything my people do is done to 110%. And I want to show this on a little bit bigger scale. So they realize when they see everything else from, like I said before, our snowshoes, our baskets, they're the most beautiful in the world. And we take serious time and pride. And that's what I want to accentuate. So if you're lucky. Yes. And you don't eat lunch, that takes a couple of weeks. Oh, yes. It takes more months because as you see, there's, uh, there's no cracks in them. So the drying process is very slow. I use wet wood. Uh, you see a lot of uh, everything these days, everybody wants everything done fast. So everything's chainsaw carving. There's very few traditional carvers left. Indigenous there is, but other than that, they want everything done fast. They want a piece done in, in 10, 15 minutes. Whereas this, uh, and this is different from out west too. Out west they use softwood, they use uh, red cedar, stuff like that. This is a hardwood, this is a butternut. So the, the amount of time is probably five times, ten times the amount because of just the hardness of the wood. Now you say there are no cracks in it. It's interesting because in Japan, 
yes. a crack in that uh, a piece of art like that yes, or a bowl, special. or even a hole which made it it's not filled with gold would be very special showing the imperfection of, of life and even nature it is and these still have cracks but over time they'll really uh they'll really accentuate and they'll really get cracked and the pieces might even split and i know that's still art but the way we do this ned bear actually uh taught me this method uh um through some other people that just through time you can you can like i said we i start with wet wood whereas other people that uh chainsaw carvers use uh kiln drying wood so this is going to be drawn dried slowly and it's a perfectly to go along with my work because the work takes so long it starts from a log this was started from a log probably close to two and a half three feet around and probably about this high and i literally just take the back off and this is literally as you see all of it is moved so there's three knocks right there to get one piece off. I'm trying to calculate how many times I do this to actually get these down. And I don't know if it's 100,000, tens of thousands, but, but the hours, and like I said, I wanna show true artwork from the East Coast, the Wabanagi, and I think uh, that is taking it to a level where I am proud of. You, you'd need someone with a Harvard MBA with nothing better to do to stand here and count and be your time and motion study person. <laughs> I would. I've done. I've done. I've gone new age a couple times, and I, I've done some slow caption stuff, like some uh, time lapse and a little bit, and shows a little bit. But yes, it shows the type of work. And like I said, it's more about my people, and I'm proud to show. People think I'm crazy sometimes. Like to spend this piece here was probably at least yeah. hundred hours, maybe a little bit more, and people just can't get over uh, the amount of work that I put into one piece. Michelangelo apparently said he only removed the stone that didn't belong there. Is What do you say? I can take that up another notch. Um, immediately what I found is, uh, as me as an artist, I didn't think, like, as a drawer, painter, I, I never had anything like that. But this is different. When I'm not using a power tool, I am using a chisel and a mallet. Now, if anybody knows anything about wood, there's grain in wood. When you follow grain, it goes nice. When you go against grain, what happens? It cracks, it breaks. That's the wood telling you, hey, you go anymore and you're gonna compromise this piece. It's gonna make it weak. So literally the size of these noses, I am cutting down and following grain. And then once that grain switches, I switch. So literally quickly, that's why these are so different. Every tree is different, every tree has grain. It can switch on it, even the same tree can switch. Well, I was, I was going to say something along the lines of the wood helps tell you what the face should look like because... I have not a clue. Like you said about my guy, it's under there and it wants to be shown, it wants to have a face. Uh, not necessarily a human face, and this is just, uh, we accept it more as humans and we, we, we connect to it more and it gets a more effect than it'd be of a, of a mouse or, 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 or a jeep log or an eagle or whatever it is. A human face just really has that connectivity. So, and that's the thing, but literally the tree wants to have a face. I've said that since day one. This is not me. This is them showing themselves. Well, I bet we all wish we had either furniture or wood floors uh, that looked like that. Uh, that's a lot of um, polishing. And then, is there other are there other treatments that you give the wood? Straight up, I am. I like boating this. I am a traditional carver. It is all done by hand. You're talking hammer and uh, our mallet and chisel, and that is hand sanded. So I hand sand that. I learned over time that the smoother I do with my, with my chisels, the less sanding I do, but still, you're looking at close to 100 hours of hand sanding. Starting at, if anybody knows about sanding, starting at about a 40 grit and ending at about a 7,000 grit. So I work my all, all the way through. And what it does, it just brings the wood, it brings the personality out and it brings the grain. And with this type of wood, this is a special wood here and this is why I use this here. This wood is all along this river. It's called butternut. My people didn't use a wood as much. We were more ash people because the ash is straight and strong. Butternut, though, is, was our most prized nut. And uh, I hope the world figures out maybe here in the future, but it is a, it is a super food. Uh, it's like muscle seal. It's like fiddleheads. It's a couple things that we have here that my people really relied on. And the nut is so precious. 
very hard to crack, very hard to um, uh, to get the stuff out of it. But it's uh, around here, if you don't get it when it's ready, they're gone immediately by the squirrel. So that tells you how amazing they are. And then any treatment such as lacquer, shellac, polish? No, all I use is linseed oil. I will do, and I like, we like doing things in, in uh, segments. So I like doing, a, it's a rule of seven for me. So I start off, uh, uh, I'll do the first coat, seven hours later, I'll do the next coat, seven days later, I'll do the next coat, seven weeks later, I'll do another coat. Why seven? It's just one of those numbers that's synonymous with our people. Like a four, a seven, those are just the numbers. We like cycles, uh, the earth, everything is in cycles. So I like to run in cycles. I find I run smoother, better, uh, symbiotic with mother nature when I run in cycles. So it must be something that's ingrained in me. Now having raised that, you are also living in an era where you are plugged in seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year with a smartphone, a cell phone, um, et cetera, computer. Does that break the cycles? I mean, should we learn something from your attitude that maybe we should unplug every now and then? Uh, yes, uh, it has been one of the best things that has happened to me. It's reconnected me to my people, my culture, my language, and my Mother Earth. Um, yes, if we can get back to doing some of the things that, you gotta remember, it doesn't matter where you came from, if you're, if you're indigenous or not. Uh, at one time for millions of years, uh, your people did this. Uh, we, were, we, we worked with stone, we worked with our hands. And once we started getting into that more, it's just, it's another, another method of meditation. You might call it, some people call it walking meditation, like when you're walking in the woods. You get, it's the same type of thing, it's a type of meditation that just brings me closer to who I am. And I think, yes, the world needs to un, unplug a little bit more and really get rid of that fogginess in our head. Um, it's static is the way I like to think of it. Once we unplug that static, we can finally start tuning into where we need to tune into. Your name.